Around the corner, do 50 chin-ups from the ledge. I'd like to walk all the way across the country with the munchies and walk to walk in Timbuktu. I'd like to walk, walk away from this world today if I can't take a walk with you. I'd like to swim in a swamp far from a phone just in case of emergency. Where it's dangerous and damp and I'm all alone and I might encounter urgency. I'd like to steal baby gators away from their mothers while I ride around in my canoe. I'd like to swim in a swamp. Picture of a policeman. Yeah, Somebody took a picture yeah, of a policeman. The they broke his camera. The they broke his camera. To, uh, because he took a picture. Um, settle and create their own, their own environment. And it's going to be Max was left behind. And when I was at the shows in Atlanta, you know, there was a strict emphasis on everyone picking up after yourself. And when everyone moved, I saw the place where people can't and, and, uh, trash. I wanted really to just promote that, that, that we're not all bad people. A simple definition of subculture is a group of people who have norms and values and beliefs that are distinct from those of the mainstream culture. And deadheads certainly qualify by that, that definition. Um, another way to think of it is just uh, people who have a distinct style of life. I immediately realized that this was the perfect theoretical framework to use to study uh, deadhead subculture, and I felt that I could make a theoretical and methodological contribution by using George Zimmel and applying him in a new way. Um, and uh, I also realized that the theoretical framework that George Zimmel used was very compatible with the view that deadheads have of their own subculture and their own, and also compatible with their worldview. The most important uh, thing about Simmel is uh, his emphasis on uh, the functioning of the mind, uh, his emphasis on the mind functioning independent of what one would call reality. And this, this is important because uh, this point of view uh, emphasizes uh, the importance of uh, human creativity. Uh, it, it emphasizes that uh, um, we have created the world we live in uh, through, our, through using our mind, uh, but it also means that since we have created it to some degree ourselves, we can also change it. Zimmel felt that you could, you could never understand things in their, their pure sense, that your understanding of them is, is mediated by other things such as time and space or what or what Zimmel called social forms. Um, we, in other words, we view things through lenses that color what we see. And um, that's very compatible with the way that deadheads look at the world. They believe that, uh, that there are many interpretations of reality and that everybody's interpretation is is somewhat valid, but none of them are are real. Simmel saw a man as a multi-dimensional being, uh, and he did only talk about man. Although I'm sure he would have included women in this statement if it had been the uh, custom at the time. Uh, he uh, he saw a man as a multi-dimensional being who's affected simultaneously by many social forms. And depending on man's circumstance, he can resist certain social forms better than other social forms. And for example, a man's circumstance might be it, as a participant in deadhead subculture. So the question becomes, what social forms do deadheads resist? Which social forms shape their behavior? Um, that's another way of saying, what separates deadheads from the mainstream and what unifies deadheads into a whole? And those were the guiding, uh, the guiding research questions in, uh, in my endeavors. The band started touring in a certain time period when there was things happening. And things have changed a lot since then. So the 80s really haven't been anything like the 60s or the 70s. And the constancy of this show every year when people come to the show, it keeps them in touch with the last 20, 25 years. There are two 
reasons to talk about why this subculture has continued to exist for as long as it has. The first answer is a historical one. The Grateful Dead was the house band for many of the electric Kool-Aid acid tests. They were closely tied to everything that happened in Haight-Ashbury in the 60s. Um, they are the heirs of the, the cultural change and the ex cultural excitement and creativity uh, that happened uh, in that exciting period of history. Um, so they are, they are a natural place for people who are at odds with current mainstream 1980s culture to go. The Grateful Dead made several decisions in the process of, of this adventure that I think have contributed to their uh, longevity. Uh, the decisions they've made have contributed to uh, loyalty among their fans rather than to mass popularity. For example, they've allowed taping, which um, has given people a way to keeping uh, contact with the concert experience between concert dates. Um, it's given them a, an opportunity to experience the concerts over and over again and to remember how exhilarating they are. They've, um, they play different music every night. So this motivates someone to go to more than one concert in a row. This brings them in contact with one another, uh, which leads to friendships. Right from the beginning, the Grateful Dead gave their fans a name. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, they published on an album uh, a request for dead freaks to unite, and people sent in their names and addresses, and the dead began mailing them information about upcoming concerts and albums, and it gave people um, an identity. The cards came addressed, Dear Deadhead. One of the things they did very early on was develop some symbols that made it possible for deadheads to identify one another outside of the concert setting. Things like the skull and lightning bolt, the dancing bears, the skull and roses. Uh, even later on, tie-dyes became a symbol. All of these symbols made it possible for deadheads to recognize one another and gave them an opening to approach a stranger. All of these things that I've mentioned, allowing taping, uh, playing different songs every night, giving their fans a name, and developing symbols, uh, cause people to keep in touch with one another. It gives them the opportunity to create a community. Deadheads are not just loyal to the uh, band and to the music. They're loyal to a community that they've created and that they belong to and that means something to them. mellow and there's people playing drums and there's more than just going on, more going on besides just selling and partying and stuff. So it's nice to come early and really be with, with the people. Anything can happen in the parking lot. You might see someone juggling. You might see somebody uh, riding a horse backwards. <laughs> you might see somebody um, reciting poetry or playing frisbee or hacky sack or, or just about anything you can imagine. Um, you might see people wearing outlandish things, things that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see a deadhead wear, but because it's the parking lot, it's OK. Um, this is, this is what we mean when we say that deadheads highly value freedom. Uh, they expect the unexpected, but then again, they don't expect anything. Uh, so it just, uh, you, it's a very um, adventurous experience to go into the parking lot. Trying to sell these bumper stickers here. I want you to take a second and read that and see what you can make out of it. Probably having a hard time with that top word. Actually, what it's saying is black, white, red, and yellow. All in one word means absolutely nothing. And that's what it's saying right there. And it's basically the same thing for people. If everyone, instead of coming together as one word, would come together as one people, then we wouldn't have to worry about, you know, the different words to categorize each other. And uh, you, guys, you guys want one of my stickers? By the summer of 1989, vending had taken over the scene. 
and there was al almost a little shopping mall set up at each concert area. Uh, there are several different types of vendors who we saw on tour this summer. There were the corporate vendors, vendors who are not deadheads and who come from the outside to make money off deadheads. And then you had the more established deadhead vendors who, to the outsider, might be indistinguishable from, from the corporate vendor, but deadheads know that they go into shows and are serious about the music. And then you had the wandering or subsistence level vendors, the vendors who merely sold enough to uh, to keep themselves on tour, to support themselves. Because everyone this needs is, to live and yeah. survive, and that's what they want to do is follow the data. It gives them inner serenity and inner peace. That's how they make their money. Like, I quit my job this summer to do this, so I've got to sell things to make a living this summer so I can just keep going around the country, going to concerts. I, I support, you know, very small business. Not like, you know, the tie-dye concessions over there, or what have, you know, the big corporation type deals, but I don't know. They sell clothing. Uh, crystals, tie-dyes, all sorts of indoor adornments. They sell um, food, uh, necessities for being on tour. You can find almost anything you need in the parking lot. The camping played a very important role in the subculture. It gave people a place to identify as home. You often saw people with living room furniture and things set up in the parking lot. I mean, it actually looked like home to many people. Uh, it gave people a community to belong to. The community might look different at every location, but it was still a community. Uh, you knew that there would be vendors, that your friends would be there, and you would, in each concert location, look around and figure out what the new map was like of your neighborhood. And when we go to try to enforce our policies, they've been real belligerent about any policies or anything that authority wants to tell them. I think they resent authority figures. Um, you find them all over the county here in Walworth County. Uh, they're, we've seen them eating out of the dumpsters, behind the grocery stores. Um, I've just heard a lot of bad stories from people. People said that they've come out of their houses and they've been showering with their garden houses and just disregarding the people, the local people's property. Freedom is expressed by deadheads in many ways, by their use of drugs, uh, by their tendency to do things that are unusual in the mainstream, like uh, changing clothes in a parking lot between two cars um, and things like that, um, that people in the mainstream might frown upon, and particularly law enforcement officials. Law enforcement officials are, of course, very prevalent in the parking lot, um, enforcing society's norms. But there is also a lot of order that's generated from within the subculture. And I think that that's important for people outside of the subculture to know. Uh, the, the Grateful Dead hire um, a group of people called the Skeleton Crew, who uh, go around the uh, parking lot in um, discouraging the sale of alcohol, uh, discouraging the sale of nitrous oxide, discouraging people from doing things that are dangerous, like setting off fireworks near gas tanks and things like that. But there's also, from deep inside the subculture, some forces of order. Uh, there is something that my students began calling deadhead vigilanteism, uh, deadheads correcting other deadheads. And I think that this has become necessary because of the great influx of, of huge numbers of deadheads after the 1987 uh, album was released. Uh, people came into the subculture too quickly to be taught how to behave responsibly. And so this summer, for example, there was a big campaign to keep the scene clean. The forces of order don't only come from outside the subculture, they also come from inside. And people who see this as a lawless, un uncontrolled mass of people entering their city aren't familiar with the intricate inner workings of the subculture. I believe 
yeah, I believe it's a subtle uh, political statement. That it's, um, you know, passive, uh, non-violent. Uh, these kids are upset about their uh, you know, their parents' values and uh, just, you know, American, uh, you know, pursuit of meaningless wealth and having our lives slip right by us. Deadheads have a very different set of norms and values and beliefs than people in the mainstream do. Uh, for one thing, it's a very cooperative subculture. Uh, if you have something that someone else needs more than you do, it's your obligation to share it. Um, it is a subculture that values individual freedom, but not at the expense of individual responsibility. Deadheads will tell you that, um, that it's important to take responsibility for yourself, that you're not supposed to get so drunk or so out of control that you infringe on the rights of other people. But within that set of constraints, deadheads believe that you should be able to think and do and feel in whatever way you want. Bury my bones by the big old graveyard, I don't even care if my head's got a stone. Bury my bones by the big old graveyard, I finally found a home of my own. They're running packs, a pack of jackals, pack of cigarettes, pack of cards, vipers, vapors, pipers, papers, pack of papers, pack a pipe in my backyard. Bury my bones by the big old graveyard while you're up, go to Europe, yeah. Bury my bones by the big old graveyard, send my flower with a flare gun while you're up there. Minerals separate the sedentary sediment, sediment, and a set of cinnamon, mint, separate element, sediment, impediment, bud keg, nutmeg, cinnamon, sin. Bury my bones by the big old graveyard, maturing, naturing, nurturing, niche. Bury my bones by the big old graveyard, I've got the scratch if you've got an itch. Mineral separate the sedentary sediment, sediment, and a set of sediment, mint, separate element, sediment, impediment, bud keg, nutmeg, sediment, sin. Bury my bones by the big old graveyard, I don't even care if my head's got a stone. Bury my bones by the big old graveyard, I finally found a home of my own. Finally found a home of my own. Woo! The drugs that deadheads use tend to be 60s drugs. Uh, marijuana, uh, LSD, psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, there are, of course, some drugs that weren't as prevalent in the 60s, nitrous oxide and ecstasy. Oftentimes, police come expecting a violent crowd, and what they find is a compliant, passive crowd. These people are real high profile with their drugs, so they're, you know, the, the police and security is real high, high profile, but as far as any kind of violence or anything like that, you know, it, there's pretty chance we pretty good chance we won't see anything like that and they've all been extremely well behaved you know if you ask them to do something they do it they don't give you a hard time it's just I guess they're into you know the peace thing the main thing that interests me about drug use in the subculture is the way the use of specific drugs affects subcultural norms <laughs> Medical grades, not industrial, good stuff, but don't mess up the brain. So, kids, they suck in like this. It gets them a little high, it's not like acid, it's not like marijuana, and stuff is clean. So, come, bitch. But hey, compared to the other drugs, good stuff. Your brain, it stops your heart and it eats the ozone, man. We've already got a big enough problem with that. Guys, people are gonna do it, man. You guys do acid, you guys do all kinds of drugs, man. LSD doesn't screw up the environment. Yeah, but LSD still yeah, makes you fine. pass out, man. It still makes you fall on your face, man. How does it do that? What's that? How does it do that? I've taken so much LSD in my lifetime, I never fall on my face. And look at you. Yeah, look at me. <laughs> look at me. Peace and love to everybody. That, that's, that's what LSD does. As the summer wore on, nitrous vendors became less and less common. Uh, in the parking lot, and there are several reasons for that. Deadheads themselves ask the nitrous vendors to stop vending, uh, both because the drug can be dangerous, it was threatening the scene, and, uh, and because um, nitrous vendors were earning too many profits and were taking the profits away from the scene. Miracle chicken comes from, I need a miracle every day. I need a miracle every day. Then it, then it, Bobby sings it, it's Bobby Payne. <laughs> a miracle ticket is like, um, we were at, I think it was Buffalo, and my friend Allison, she had an extra ticket, and she, we walked around, we just gave it away for free. 
Like those are the true miracle tickets. Those happen every now and then. But like a miracle ticket is just when you don't have a ticket and you want to see a show so bad and you don't have to pay like more than face value really. That's good. We don't support scalpers. <laughs> That's why we're still looking. <laughs> Deadheads often show up at concerts without tickets um, for good reasons. Usually they manage to get a ticket. It's very unusual for a deadhead to be quote unquote shut out of a show. Um, there are a lot of people in the subculture who get a great deal of pleasure by giving people tickets and, and getting to watch their enthusiastic response. Um, and uh, you know this gets back to the idea that if you have something that someone else needs and that you don't need, that you're supposed to share it. And so some of the uh, better healed members of the subculture make a practice of buying tickets and uh, redistributing them to deadheads who don't have the money to purchase them. Uh, so people arrive looking for miracle tickets, which are tickets that you don't have to pay for. Uh, deadheads arrive willing to pay for tickets in some cases, having traveled you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles to get there with no real assurance that they're going to get into the show. My, my friend Melinda made this sign, and we keep it. It's for all of us on tour, and we use it whenever we need a special miracle to happen, and it always works. Yeah, it's, it's been our best. The concert means different things to different people. But I would say that for everyone, it's a confirmation of membership in the subculture. The concert is an opportunity to feel part of something larger than yourself. It's the opportunity to feel like you belong. Uh, it's an opportunity for communitas, uh, for sharing with equals. It's an opportunity to come out of yourself and to have what may approach an, a spiritual experience or just an ecstatic, joyful experience for those who aren't spiritual uh, in, their, in their tendencies. Uh, it's a joyous occasion where everyone feels unified. Uh, as one deadhead put it, when you go to a Grateful Dead concert, you're there with everybody else. You're not there by yourself. A very honest band. They come out every night and they just play what they feel like playing. They don't have a prearranged set and you know they just come out and mimic every night in a different city. They come out and genuinely play to the crowd. They feel how the crowd is. If the crowd's upbeat and energetic, they play a rowdy show. If the crowd's kind of, you know, I tried to sell a ticket for $100. It's like, look at it. My God, would I dress like this if I had $100? Yeah. I don't think so. I was basically dragged to my first show. I was given a ticket and told to drive by a friend of mine who had no ride to the show. And uh, I found the best drugs there, and they're still the best drugs you can get. And the feelings that go around here, and people who really care will will come, whether they can sell things in the park. Younger line. crowd that that seems to be attracted uh, steadily, meaning the college scene. There's part of the college scene is always going to be interested in seeing the Grateful Dead. The point of view that uh, tries to take into account. Um, uh, all the influences that uh, enter you, your mind and, and, and your body. Uh, this holistic point of view, if you, if you will, I think is, uh, is typically simulian. And uh, uh, should, uh, it should be possible to use that, uh, that kind of approach uh, for, uh, for analyzing, uh, or at least for describing, um, an experience such as a, as a, as a concert. What we found, of course, was that Zimmel was right, that 
one social form does not exist in isolation without its opposing social form. Where there was freedom, there was order. Where there was cooperation, there was conflict. And understanding how those, those two opposing social forms exist in a delicate balance is one of the ways that I've begun to understand the dynamics of the subculture. So I see this study not just as a study to learn about deadheads, but also as a study to learn about how to study American subcultural diversity. I, I think that people also underestimate how important it is to study popular culture. Maybe 30 or 40 years ago, when the media were not nearly as important as they are today, it would have made sense to think of this as an insignificant topic. But in today's world, where we're constantly bombarded with the radio, the television, the newspaper, magazines, comic books, and what have you, we have to learn how to understand the effect that that has on our lives. And you can't study the whole thing at once. I've carved out one little chunk, and I'm trying to understand that. Perhaps if we can understand how the Grateful Dead have affected the lives of deadheads, it will bring us one step further to understanding the big picture. Thank you.